Hello and welcome to podcast seven, where today we're going to move the focus to health and education. And I'm delighted to have joining me today, Professor John Howarth from North Cumbria Integrated Care. I've got Emma Jackson, the head teacher at St. Benedict's School, and I've got Chris Natras, the principal at Lake College, Lakes College at Lily Hall. Uh, welcome all three of you to the meeting this morning and, and thanks well for, for joining us. Uh, you know, clearly uh, topics of, of interest to virtually everyone in, in our community. Professor Howarth, if I could start with you, uh, you know, could you just bring us up to date with your current situation? Yes, thanks, Mike. Um, um, so I've been the strategic uh, commander for the local trust and leading the N local NHS response to, uh, to this outbreak. Um, we had our first case in North Cumbria in the, on the 2nd of March, uh, first confirmed case, and it took about six weeks from the hospital perspective to build up to the peak. So the peak of deaths and cases in the hospital was, um, took about six weeks, about the 11th of April, we think, we peaked and we've been going down very slowly since then. The deaths in the hospital setting have gone down very um, significantly, so that's, that's a, a relief, uh, but we still have over 100 people uh, as we speak this morning uh, who have uh, tested COVID for positive, uh, COVID for uh, positive in our hospitals across uh, North Cumbria. That includes the community hospitals uh, as well. So we're far from out of the um, of the challenge yet. Uh, probably about four weeks beyond the peak now in the hospital setting. Um, in the wider community, there's good evidence that transmission, the fantastic response of the local public uh, has, has led to a very marked decrease in transmission out, outside in the community. But we're very concerned about, of course, about the care home settings now, which are seeing significant numbers of cases and sadly a number of deaths uh, here in North Cumbria and, and nationally as well. Emma, thanks to you. The last time we spoke, Emma, it was the, the launch of a, of a brand new school, the launch of a new era, newly appointed. You know, this would be a challenge that you wouldn't have expected at, at that time. But can you just explain a little bit to us about what the hub school is and how that's working? Yeah, um, in Copeland, um, in North Copeland, we have two hub schools, one at Orgill in Egremont, one at Jericho Primary School in Whitehaven. But those hubs serve all the children of that area. And we, we currently take children from two years of age up to about 14, 15 um, years of age. So right across uh, both phases. We also have Mayfield open as well uh, for our more vulnerable uh, special needs children. So the hub schools are served by the staff of all the schools in the area. We um, run that on a rota basis. So there are some secondary colleagues in there, some primary colleagues and all the head teachers supporting that. And parents can book that on a daily, a weekly basis if they're a key worker and they can access either Orgill or Jericho um, and attend their regularly and we have some children that attend almost every day and some that attend maybe once a week and so on and we also open that up to um, vulnerable families and those who might need a bit of extra support as well. But all, all your staff as well are working from home at, at the moment? That's that's right. Um, they're uh, setting lessons on on things like Teams, uh, OneNote, uh, Google Drive. We're using lots and lots of technology to engage with the students. And I know the secondary schools in the area are doing that. And in terms of the primary schools, they're using technology more as well and using lots of online resources. But so the staff are all working really hard from home. Yeah, Chris, the, you know, the, you know, the Lakes College, you, you've got various students, you know, some employed on day release and, you know, how are you dealing with things uh, and, you know, how did you react to the, you know, the initial lockdown? It, it, all, it all came quite sudden in the end, didn't it? Uh, it did, Mike. Yeah, and, um, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, we're, we're a, a relatively large, you know, complex organisation at Lakes. Um, we're a technical college, but we, we also do a lot of community activity. And as you say, we've got... Um, some students who come in for one day because that's you know their program, and some in every day, um, and lots in between. And um, all told, about four thousand students and about two hundred and fifty staff. And in a very short period of time, a matter of days, we had to close down the building. Um, and uh, for any of the listeners who've been to Lakes College, it, it's it's a it's a pretty complex 
um, estate to uh, to close down. So we had to migrate all of our students, all 4,000 of them, onto an online learning platform. We had to migrate 250 staff, more or less, um, into their kind of home offices. And then we had to put the building into a kind of a steady state. Um, I've got to say, we... We either through good morning or good fortune or happenstance, however you describe it, we were quite well advanced in our investment in online learning. So um, we were able to put our plan into place, really. And and one thing about education in particular and, and further education, um, we, we're used to change <laughs> um, and we're used to reacting pretty quickly. So we kicked our plan in. We've moved everybody very, very swiftly across to an online learning platform. Canva is the one we use. Um, and we've tried to maintain online classes as your normal timetable would fit. So it hasn't been without its challenge, I've got to say, but um, um, hats off to everybody uh, involved, all the students, apprentices, our community groups that use the site, staff. It's been as smooth, I think, as you could possibly make it, I have to say. You, like, uh, like my own organisation, Chris, you were the victim of, a, of an interstate cyber attack that, uh, that affected you quite badly. Your, your camera's gone off there, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, Can the, you see me now? Come, coming out and recovering from that cyber attack, uh, do you think sort of a refreshing of all your ITs helped you uh, during this crisis? Yeah, you're absolutely right there, Mike. I think there's two things there. Well, three. One, it was an, an, an awful period for us where we had to take apart and rebuild our entire IT system owing to a hack, which is, you know, many of us have experienced, sadly. Um, but that was that gave us um, um, two things, really. One, it, it allowed us to reinvest in some contemporary IT. That's helped us, no doubt, in moving across to an online learning methodology during this period. And secondly, it gave us an emergency planning um, experience so that our COVID-19 emergency planning group could kick in and we had some fairly recent experience of dealing with an unexpected emergency. Good. Professor Howell, just coming back to you, you know, we, we, within the health service and, you know, we meet regularly through uh, varying forums that, you know, the pressures are always on. Um, you know, pre-COVID and post-COVID, you know, the, the, every, the day-to-day work. But, you know, I'm reading in, you know, the, I guess I've got two questions that people would be keen to get an answer to. Is why, are, why is Cumbria so high? Um, you know, why are cases in Cumbria so high in comparison? Uh, you know, given the wide open spaces and things like that, uh, you know, you would think we'd, we'd be somewhere near the lower end. Uh, you know, if we pick that one up first, really, the, uh, you know, wh why do you feel Cumbria is so high? Well, Cumbria is the, the oldest part of the northwest. We've got the oldest population. So if you just take that into account, we probably calculate, I've been working with our director of public health on this, and we probably calculate that we would expect probably about 28% more cases than other parts of the, the northwest and, and England average. Um, um, the biggest risk factor above everything else is age uh, for uh, the death rate and the, uh, uh, serious infections and admission to hospital and critical case. Um, there are other risk factors, but the age is the main one. The second is that um, I think we're, our um, uh, school terms were different to some other parts of the country. We had a large number of people went particularly to northern Italy. Uh, coming back, uh, and so a lot of the outbreaks, the initial outbreaks um, uh, that we had were earlier than many other parts of the country. So uh, it's a combination of the age and probably being ahead of the curve. So we, we've tracked much more closely to London than other parts of the northeast or, or northwest, and we're going down now faster than some other parts that are, are still maybe plateauing and, and coming down. So those are the two two explanations. Um, <laughs> The early half term, the, the trips and the seeding back into Cumbria. Our first case was we were one of the first areas of the country to be getting cases um, um, and also the age age profile of our population. Has it been aggravated by the fact that we're in tourist resort? Um, well, we don't have evidence for that. Um, the um, Clearly, we have... Uh, the, this is spread, the main spread is people. 
and it's the proximity of people. So this is spread by droplets, coughing and sneezing. Secondary spread uh, is on surfaces and, and so on. But the primary way of spreading this is, is people coming into close proximity with each other. So you can imagine as a, as a county, if you have a large number of people from different parts of the country visiting regularly. I know this is one of the anxieties we have about when lockdown uh, uh, rises. So we're uh, uh, an area that traditionally gets people from all over the country and internationally as well coming in into this area. So the potential for sparking further outbreaks uh, is significant within um, our uh, tourist um, tourist orientated uh, geography. In the new year, uh, you know, the, the UK became the, uh, you know, the highest number of deaths across Europe. Uh, have, you, have you a view on, on why we are, you know, seeing more cases than uh, than other countries across Europe? Yeah, I've been following the the data really carefully, right from the early modelling through to the, the all the, the graphs and the, the trends and so on. So you've got to be careful um, in uh, comparing just crude numbers because we have different populations. So the population of Italy is 60 million, now is 66 million. So you'd expect us to have 10% more than Italy if we were tracking yeah. the same. Um, and so a lot of the way uh, figures are presented isn't very helpful. However, there's no doubt that we are, have a very significant and high uh, uh, rates in, into, into this country. Now, I think as we look back on this and analyse the our early actions that we took when we introduced lockdown, when we uh, the ability to uh, track and, and trace and test people, uh, which we uh, our testing is now ramped right up. But at the beginning, for quite some time, we had no testing. We have to let, also remind ourselves that this was reported to the WHO on the 31st of December. So we're only four and a bit months in to a new disease globally. So a new disease started in a probably in the markets in Wuhan spread caused significant numbers of deaths, several hundred deaths in Cumbria um, within four, four and a bit months. Um, so it's been a dramatic and dynamic um, 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 uh, challenge that we've had to face. But I think what will, there'll be a lot of analysis as to how different governments have, have, have tackled this, particularly the decisions taken early on. Because if you take a decision on lockdown, the evidence is that it takes two to three weeks really for the impact of the lockdown to start to break the transmission. There's a thing called R0, which is the reproduction number. It has to get less than one stop the, uh, for the, the, the um, outbreak to fizzle out. And, and so particularly if you're ahead of the curve, uh, you know, it, 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 and if you take a, on a national average, and if you're ahead of the curve, a lockdown measures are going to be less impactful other areas like London and Cumbria that were ahead of the curve than perhaps those that were um, some parts of the southwest, for example, have had very few cases and hospitals. I look at their data, they've had very small numbers compared to us. So we were further ahead on the curve <laughs> than the measures that were taken. Okay, and let's come back to you. Yeah. Um, you know, you, how are you getting yourself organized now to to, to, to deliver <laughs> the, the lessons to the kids and you know not come to you know what sort of concerns do you have about, about the general health and well-being of the students because you know as a your know, schools play a large part in that as well as the education yeah we do um in terms of um making sure the health and well-being is okay we've set up quite a, a rigorous system now that's taken a little bit of time to put into place but we check in with the children um almost on a daily basis from the teacher's point of view because they're using technology to set the work they know when children haven't responded to the work but also um, students have to check in with us as well and through that system they have to let us know that they're okay um, and if they're not we give them a call we can offer support we can contact parents we can chat with them through teams there are lots of different ways that we can support their well-being with that and we know that some families have struggled with that online learning um, it might be that somebody, you know, there's one laptop for three mm. children in a house or whatever. So we've tried to support that as much as we possibly can. And if parents have got in touch with us, we've suggested ways that we can help with that. And lots of our learning mentors, for example, in school are contacting students on a daily basis. I mean, lots of our emphasis has been around year 11 and year 13 initially 
because of course we had all um, the cancellation of the examinations and so on. So teachers are working hard to try and predict um, exam grades for them. But then our focus has had to change as well to year 10 and year 12, because those are the students who are going to be taking GCSEs and A-levels next year and are missing quite a big chunk of time in school. So in terms of setting the work for them, we're trying to make sure we keep them in that habit of learning um, and that the standard and expectation of the work is as high as it would be in school really and obviously that does put some pressure on some of the students to make sure they're keeping up with their timetables and keeping up with the work so we've tried to balance that well-being with the fact that they do need to stay in that habit of learning and keeping going and so on uh, and trying to make contact as much as we can through all our different um comms you know communication methods that we have really so that is there for them chris the, you know similar uh, sort of question for yourself how, how are you managing to keep your students engaged you know your yours are obviously older students and uh, some of them are, are, are employed as well uh, yeah you know, what, what processes have you got to keep people engaged we've got um probably three broad categories of students. We've got the full-time uh, younger students who are with us most of the week. We've got getting on for 1,400 apprentices with five, six, 700 employers uh, dotted around. And then we've got um, lots of people who engage with us on a part-time basis, perhaps adult learners. So we, we've we've reflected the difference in those um, different sort of client groups in, in how we're approaching things. Um, we, the system that I referred to earlier, we invested in, um, ha is actually an online classroom system. So we still have teachers engaging with classes with students, um, just on, on, a, on a platform very much like you and I are using now. So 15 to 20 students are joining a class with a teacher for an hour and a half. Um, and that's working well. Um, so we're learning as we go and we're refining it. But by and large, that is working well. With regards to the students who perhaps may be in a vulnerable group in that for safeguarding reasons or for their learning needs, we've got our team of learning mentors and additional learning support staff who are doing individual bespoke uh, work and support with them to make sure that out with what I've just described as online classroom learning, we've still got that one-to-one -one particular attention around any students who've got particular concerns. Some of that might be mental well-being, it might be distress for other reasons, it might be vulnerability to do with safeguarding. And um, just like Emma and every other school and college, we know our students well. So it's just a question of saying, how do we adapt to the fact that you're not coming into college? How do we make sure that um, the support is there for you? We also uh, link very closely with the uh, County Council and other agencies, and there's been some really strong evidence of collaboration in there to make sure that any any students, young people in particular, that, that have vulnerability, we make sure that the agencies are um, around them to make sure that, that they're okay. And then just from a health and safety point of view, um, we, we've got protocols in place to make sure that people are following good practice about working um, in isolation, working from home, home office, with a, a checklist to make sure that you've, that you've got all the things in place that you need. And um, I've got to say, uh, just to finish that point, our, our estate staff have been fantastic because we've hand-delivered over 150 laptops and dongles around uh, the west of Cumbria. Um, and if any of you have been to some hidden away postcodes, you'll know what the challenge for that is. Um, and make sure that people have the kit that they need to, to access um, what they want to do. Uh, and the last point, if I may, is about our work with apprentices. And that's challenging because all apprentices are employed and, um, you know, the, the, the reality of, of industry and employment and organisations at the moment is very different to what it was um, before COVID-19. So we're doing what we can to try and keep as many apprentices as possible in engaged learning and support their employers in whatever way we can with the challenges that we're facing. So a lot going on, but, um, you know, we're, we're, we're keeping on top of it. Good to hear. Professor Howarth, um, you know, we spoke earlier, you know, the hospitals and, and the health services always under pressure because, you know, people have heart issues, there's, there's cancer issues. 
and, and you know, again, we're hearing, uh, you know, the number of referrals in, in those sort of areas dropping off uh, dramatically. Um, you know, have you got a message that you would send out to people about, you know, that yeah. you are still open for business? Yeah, I, I think there's some strong messages I'd like to pass on, Mike. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank all the public and everybody who's uh, observed the shutdown, because that will save more lives than the things that we're doing in the hospital, uh, a lot more lives, um, by stopping the spread, because the modelling of what would have happened without that was was very alarming. Um, talking about thousands, of, it would have, we would have had thousands of deaths rather than hundreds of deaths. We would have had thousands of deaths here in North Cumbria. So a big thanks because it's been really difficult. The health impacts of this spread across the physical and mental health. So there's massive mental health impacts of this, uh, and I'm sure our, our, our educational colleagues are seeing some of this with in their pupils. Uh, the impact of social isolation. There's huge evidence that social isolation adversely impacts health. It's supposed to be equivalent to about smoking 15 a day in terms of risk risk terms. Uh, lots of evidence for that. So when we started, we were focusing very much on reducing the excess deaths, both from uh, directly from COVID and indirectly from COVID. Um, now, as this has evolved, it's become clearer and clearer that the indirect effects are going to probably kill more people or impact more people than the direct uh, death rates uh, from COVID. We are seeing already, even in the first few weeks, uh, extra deaths that are not COVID related and probably linked to people not presenting. Um, and so we, our stroke clinics are really quiet. Um, uh, people are sitting at home with stroke. So you've got to think fast face, drooping face, arm, a, a weakness in the arm. If you put your arms out and one just drifts away, that's a, a potentially a sign of a, a stroke. Um, a speech, the slurring of the speech, and the T is tied to dial 999. So if you think you have a stroke, you need to be still dialing 999. Heart attack clinics are much quieter. Uh, cancer referrals have dropped to less than 50%. There's a thing called two-week wait referrals, which is an urgent pathway for suspected cancer, all but dried up. Um, um, so very concerned. I'm a local GP, as you know, Mike, um, worked in the West for over 30 years very, very concerned about the impact of ongoing impact, not all of which will show in the next week or two. Some of these will, will show spikes of, of death rates a year, two years on if you miss cancer. So if you're sitting at home with um, blood loss from anywhere really, or if you're, um, blood in the urine or blood in the bowels or coughing up blood or losing weight or getting more and more breathless or um, things that you think are really not right. Um, the general practice is still open. The hospitals are still open. A and &E is still open. And um, you've got the, the 111, both online and, and um, telephone services to dial. So we, I'm really concerned that um, we'll have more people die from the indirects of, of COVID-19 than the direct effects. So we want people to start to come back to us. Both general practice and the hospitals have got COVID-free zones as ways of safely treating people. A lot of use, a lot of use of digital technology, but people need to be examined both in general practice and in hospitals. Still doing it, and we want to do more of it because that's a big concern that we have at the moment. I think that's an interesting message to get to get out there because I would imagine that a lot of people, uh, you know, are worried about going into hospital with other ailments at this time because of the risk, of, the perceived risk of catching coronavirus. So, you know, the fact that you've got um, separate wards to, to deal with, I think that's a good message to get out there. Yeah, and we test everybody who comes into the hospital now, gets tested on entry, so we can then place them. It takes a bit of time to get the test back, but we can place them more and more accurately into the right right areas. So we have COVID-free wards and, and um, Clinic, uh, uh, clinics and an A and E is now zoned. So we've essentially redesigned and rezoned the whole um, flow of uh, for for people. Similarly, in general practice, there are hot clinics where they call them red clinics, uh, red zones, uh, where if you've got suspected COVID, you can be assessed with all the uh, correct um, uh, PPE. But there's also regular clinics that you can fill uh, um, in in the uh, non-COVID areas. So. We don't respond to this 
what we'll find is a massive. We'll think that we've got you know with with you previous question about doing worse in Italy. Well, we could do a lot worse in the other if we sit at home with conditions that need to be this scene. The final point I make is the thing as a, a public health background as well um, worries me is the, in, the economic impacts of this and, and we'll know poor we make a population the more long-term adverse health consequences and educational consequences will be um, so that's a, a medium and longer term worry I have but the big worry at the moment is that people are not presenting with the things that we really want to see um, um, yeah, Emma, just coming to you, uh, Professor Howard there spoke about long-term impacts. You know, what, what are your, you know, the children, uh, the students have had quite a long period out of school already, uh, which could go on for, for quite, you know, none of us know how long this is going to last. Uh, are you, have you got any concern for the long-term impact of, of missing that big chunk of education? Or, or do you think, you, you know, through the measures that's been taken, it's been addressed completely? No, I don't think it's been addressed completely at all, really. Um, I mean, we I, I come from a, a primary background, I teach in secondary now, but six weeks holidays always affects children in terms of their progress in the summer. So this is going to have a, just as big an impact, if not more, really. Um, we have got lots of online learning across primary and secondary sector, but obviously that isn't like being in front of a teacher in a classroom. That it's not the same. Um, and I think you know children's learning will be affected. Um, but we're all going to be affected. There is some research to say that um, disadvantaged families might be adversely affected by this. So we need to make sure that we have resources in place to address that when and when we get back into school. Um, we have lots of things that we need to think about in terms of coming back, um, social distancing, not least, of course, and how we get, in my case, 1,200 students back in. There's no possible way we could get them all back into the building at the same time and be two metres apart. That just wouldn't work. So we have to look at how we're going to adapt our timetables, our curriculum and so on. Primary colleagues tell me, you know, you can't socially distance two and three year olds in a nursery. That's really quite difficult. Um, so we need to look at all of that going forward. Um, but there is bound to be an impact on on learning that, um, and gaps in learning and so on. What we'll have to do as skilled professionals, as teachers, is identify those gaps when we get back to some sort of normality and make sure we fill those, we go over, we revise learning, we make sure that, you know, we've put everything in place to mitigate that risk as much as possible of children falling behind. Chris, it'll be similar for, for, for your guys, you know, there's a a big chunk of time here that they're, they're, they're going to be out of the learning cycle and you know even you know with home learning and we've got a lot of people working from home and you know potentially four or five people in one house and they can't all access um, IT at the same time um, you know how do you see the the journey out of lockdown yeah <laughs> absolutely you're quite right Mike and I agree 100 percent with what Emma's just said there um I think one of the we're, I, speaking further in higher education, pretty much everybody has made a choice to participate. It isn't necessarily compulsory. And I think one of it, 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 there's no point trying to create ideal circumstances and wish that, you know, things weren't the way they were. That That's not going to be helpful to anyone. So we need to work within the constraints that we have and be positive. One of the key one of the key messages that we have at Lakes College is potential. So um, one, of the, one of the things that we're gonna be working hard on is engaging people in their motivation for why they are learning, why they're on a course, how does it link to their career? How does it link to their prospects? How they are benefiting themselves? Um, I think if we, can, if we can do what Emma said, which is to work on the gaps and work on, despite everyone's best, who has missed what? And if we can, if we can add that to a sense of reinvigorating people and re-motivating them to say, look, the jobs market is going to be as tight as ever for the next few years. You are definitely going to benefit yourself by developing skills, gaining qualifications, making sure that you demonstrate 
that you are um, doing what you can to build your knowledge, skills and experience. If we can combine those two things and say, yep, we'll catch up and also you want to catch up, then I think that's going to be um, core. I think um, also it's important that, that everybody understands that education, schools, colleges, universities, we are adapting to circumstances, but we are, you know, we're seeking to recruit people to programmes. Um, we've got Virtual Discovery Week happening from the 18th of May, which is a virtual tour of the college. It's an opportunity to get careers advice, make applications, have one-to-one -one online with a, with a, with a, with, um, you know, an expert. You can find out about courses. So what we don't want is we don't want people to plateau and just think COVID-19, who expects us to engage, who expects us to be. It's just a question really of, of saying, well, let's move it to a slightly different scenario. And then um, as, as Emma says, you know, bringing thousands of, of students um, back into to, to the estate, that's not going to happen overnight. And we are going to have to do this carefully and do it in a phased manner, I would suggest. Um, and just, you know, make sure that people are given every opportunity to, to re-engage and do something positive and come out of COVID-19 with some, you know, some real a sense of, right, I'm on with this and um, people are here to help me. Mm -hmm. Professor Howard did say it's anticip widely anticipated that on Sunday, the prime minister will, will start a, a process of easing uh, you're relaxing some of the uh, the lockdown measures. That's not going to be easy in itself because we've spent the last couple of months telling people they need to stay in and uh, and then protect the NHS and save lives. And you know, what concerns do you have of uh, easing out of lockdown? And you know, what plans have you got in place uh, to address those concerns? So we. Um... So if you think about this in phases, uh, there is a, a first phase with the, the peak of the epidemic coming up and down. We're well on the downward uh, track of that now. Um, what we've got, though, is uh, most of the evidence coming forward is, uh, suggests um, that probably, very, very likely, the majority of the population is still susceptible to this. There's still lots of work to do. This is still emerging. Uh, and we'll learn more as new serology tests, the antibody tests come forward, uh, come forward. But most of the evidence from around the world suggests that we do not have what they call herd immunity now. So you know, maybe 80, 90, 90 plus percent of the population is still being susceptible. So we, we could get a second wave. We could get a second wave, a double bump at the beginning, you know, so we'd come right down, but never quite get to the bottom and it surges again. And one of the things that uh, many of us are worried about is a big surge in winter at the same time as influenza, other respiratory viruses that make it quite difficult to distinguish whether it's coronavirus um, and, and you know, the traditional uh, pressures on, on, the, on the NHS. So the government obviously know all of this um, and what they're trying to do is to work out using as much science as possible the various steps to, uh, so there will not be a big step of release of every lockdown measure. Um, it will need to, to be gradually done, uh, um, a gradual introduce, uh, in introduction of um, the uh, economic activity, business restart and starting the schools, um, all being very carefully tracked as well. What we've got now that we didn't have at the beginning is, is uh, a significant testing capability. And then building an army of, 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 of contact traces and, and with a new NHS app. Uh, so the, the successes of places like South Korea was that they've been using this from the word go. We've had to build this and we've really got it now. So what will happen, the next phase will be characterised by smaller outbreaks. Care homes worry me a lot, uh, but smaller outbreaks that will be will contact traced and then um, isolated to try and just smother and put out the 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 the, the bushfires. If you see what I mean, small fires that will burn with with those were those measures. So uh, we do have some more tools in our armory now to to tackle this. Uh, in terms of the preparation for uh, from a hospital point of view, uh, of course we've still um, got limitations on visiting, and we'll 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 lift these as we in accordance with national guidance, but we're gradually switching back on 
uh, routine surgery, trying to get some of the um, activity uh, done that, because as I come back to my previous point, the biggest concern really is that the building up a massive store of, of excess deaths and illness that is not COVID related. And if we don't get the balance right, in this, what they'll do is track it very carefully. If they find the R0 is drifting up, which is a reproduction number, so that's the number of people. So an infected person will affect a certain number of other people. If it's more than one, you get a spreading epidemic. If it's less than one, it's fizzling out. But they'll want to take measures that are calculated to keep that below one. And there's quite a bit of science behind which measures you can lift and have minimal impact, and which ones would tip you back over to one and get a big surge. So it will be very gradual, it will be stepped, it will be um, with a view to taking other steps backwards. If it come, got completely out of control again, lockdown will come back. So that's why we need to, as a community, not drift out of lockdown. We, we need to try, because if we do it too soon by drifting out, what we'll find is that we'll just get a second big surge and it'll all come back and all the economic impact will be even worse because we've not managed to contain it. Enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. Emma, in conclusion, have you got any sort of messages that you'd like to get out, key messages to you, to students, to parents, uh, or, or, or residents in general about the education sector? Um, I think I'd like to to finish my by saying thank you um i'm quite lucky in that my children aren't of school age anymore i can't quite imagine what it would have been like trying to work from home with two little ones to teach at the same time even as a trained teacher um i think people are tr really trying their best in terms of the home learning i hear that people are using lots of the online stuff as well joe wicks pe and so on and jamie oliver's cooking um people are trying their best and i think as long as we're trying our best at home with the home learning. That's all we can do, really. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to thank the parents um, and thank the students who are trying hard and thank my staff as well. Uh, and the staff across the whole of the primary and secondary sector in Copeland. Um, we're, we're doing a really good job. And I think sometimes we need to remind ourselves of that. Absolutely, I agree entirely. Chris, in conclusion, have you got any final comments you would wish to make? I echo what Emma just said. She's hit the nail on the head. Um, I've been amazed at how, how people deal have dealt with flexibly um, these changing circumstances. It's amazing. Um, I would just stress that the the benefits of, of lifelong learning and uh, lakes, you know, speaking from a lakes point of view, the life changing stuff that we do, all we're doing is slightly adjusting how we're doing that. Um, the, the benefits have not gone away. Just a little good news story to share with you, Mike. At the end, um, given that our estate has nobody in it, um, we've worked with the, uh, just an example of our community work, we've worked with the uh, constabulary so that the police can use the estate for training their police dogs, which they've been over the moon about. And um, if you can imagine 50 dogs in your car park, um, that's been quite a thing. So, we're, you know, let's be positive uh, as, as far as we can. And uh, let's think about moving to what you might call the new normal. Yeah, I think there's quite a lot to be uh, positive about right across Cumbria. John, uh, finally, uh, to coming to, to yourself, across the UK, the, the population of Great Britain uh, loves the NHS. Yeah. Uh, they the demonstrate an awful lot of support for the NHS um, at the moment. You know, we, you know we, we're seeing people delivering food and clapping every Thursday. Is that having a good effect on uh, on the I mean, morale of staff? Fantastic effect on, on the morale. Uh, and I echo comments from our colleagues uh, about the staff. Uh, our staff cross hospital, primary care, into the social care council, the home care work. The, 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 every everybody, the, the response to this has brought out the best in 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 society and our staff. And I've been a doctor for 36 years now, and I, I, this is the proudest moment of being part of the NHS. And I hear the Thursday clapping, and that makes a big difference. Good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that's getting through because, uh, you know, all of you today, thank you very much for uh, for joining me. Um, you know, it is appreciated right across the community, the fantastic job. Uh, that you're all doing and you know in one way or another you're caring for people from cradle to grave with, with education and uh, and health and play such a vital role 
uh, in our community. So Emma, Chris, uh, John, thank you for joining me this morning. I think that's been really informative and I look forward to seeing you all uh, again shortly in more normal times. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Right, we're off record.